motivation today. And the, the distinction between motivation and emotion is not clear. They're both words that sort of function within a linguistic context. But for the sake of argument, and of course all the emotions aren't the same. It's not like there's one circuit that subsumes emotion. There's multiple circuits that subsume emotion, and they're not identical circuits, you know. So it isn't like every emotion is a variant of the same thing. It's not, and it's the same with the motivation. So they're very loose groupings, motivation and emotion. But for the purposes of our argument, we're going to make this case. Roughly, motivations set goals. And roughly, emotions orient you in relationship to those goals. Now, like I said, those categories overlap. Anger is usually considered an emotion, and it often has a goal, right? The goal is to hit something or hurt something. That's, that's one possible goal. So emotions can segue quite easily into motivational states, but whatever. You've got to use a category system of some sort to clear, clarify things, and so that's what we're going to, we're going to uh, pursue. Motivation set goals. It's actually more complicated than that. You know, I showed you that little oval diagram with, uh, you know, desired future and unbearable present, so to speak. Motivations actually don't just set goals. They also prime behavior, and they also set up the perceptual frame within which you interpret the world. So, for example, if you're hungry, it isn't just that you're driven to eat. First of all, eating is a very complex behavior, especially if it's associated with food preparation, say. You're... The, the systems that you've used in the past to procure food and then to ingest it are sort of disinhibited by the motivational state. So they're at the ready. And then your sensory system is tuned so that it's going to focus on those things that are relevant to eating and tune out everything else. So the motivational state also does perceptual tuning. And then there's a felt component of it as well. So it's not... It's, it's not reasonable to only say that motivation sets goals or that it drives behavior. It, it does three things. Goal setting, behavioral driving, plus it provides a perceptual schema within which those other two things make sense. And so a motivated state in some sense is like a little micro-personality. It's, it's only got one aim. It's, it's sort of a one-eyed micro-personality. You know? So it's only aiming at one thing, but it still has all the other aspects of personality. So sort of, you know, for me that, that aligns nicely with the psychoanalytic idea that, you know, you're, 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 a, you're a loose aggregation of multiple fragmented personalities, you know, they're sort of coherently tied together at the highest level of analysis, but they can go off and do their own thing. You see that in situations, for example, like eating disorders, where the hunger system itself starts to become almost a spun-off part of the personality, and the rest of the personality then wars with that, and that's sort of in some sense, that's like cortex versus hypothalamus, and you never win. Cortex does not win over hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is what keeps you alive. So it's one of the things that keeps you alive. You could do without your cortex, but you cannot do without your hypothalamus. And the connections stretching upwards from the hypothalamus, which is a very old brain area, are much more powerful than the connections coming down from the cortex to modulate the hypothalamus. And that's another indication of just exactly who's in charge when the chips are down. You know, and that's why it's so hard for you to override your basic emotions or motivational states. It's like the system evolved to keep you alive, and it's not particularly willing to give up control, in a sense, given that your survival is staked on its function. So it's useful to know that because, you know, if you... If you, if you if you pursue psychology and you stay within the human side of psychology, say, instead of wandering off into the animal behavioral research, you'll see that most human psychologists and neuropsychologists are very corticocentric. They really like to think that it's the newly evolved parts of the brain that are in charge, and that's just not right. The newly evolved parts of the brain are in charge only when nothing is bothering you. Like, if you're not hungry, you're not thirsty... You're not too excited, you're not too curious, you're not too terrified, you know, you're not too cold, you're not too warm, any of those, then the cortex is in charge. But if you deviate substantially across any of those dimensions, the probability that control over your behavioral output and your perceptions is going to devolve down the evolutionary hierarchy to more primordial brain areas is extremely likely. You know, and you see the same thing happens, you know, maybe you're having a discussion with someone, right? And they exhaust 
the limits of your rational knowledge, which means basically they out-argue you. Well, what happens? Well, usually what happens is that people cry or they get angry. And it's like they're out of cortex, it's bang, right down to the, more, the lower and more primary evolutionarily determined systems. So, 